because it's laying out a process of canceling the old system of obligation and debt and ends the, ends the film with um, having to do everything out of love. And a guy who claimed that God had, that God had abandoned him after his wife committed suicide when their child um, had died in childbirth, um, he sets on a quest to find reconciliation with God. He starts off pretty rough by killing his priest. But anyway, so he goes from there. And uh, and he, the journey is remarkable. Um, even at the very beginning, ironically enough, the powers that be that run the world think they have power through their pyramids. And as an opening scene, you can see the character Godfrey, played by uh, Liam Neeson, who comes into the to the um, blacksmith station, and he looks out over a valley, and there's a pyramid on the left side of the screen. There's a giant pyramid down the valley. It's kind of hard to see it at first, but it's there. And there's a scene right at the very end of the movie where uh, Balian by Orlando Bloom, looks out at the same scene and the pyramid's gone. And there's a scene even where the, uh, the um, Knights Templars attack an unarmed caravan and there's three pyramids in the mountains behind it. I believe all telling us what it, what, how it's been used for evil and how we're to switch back and to not go into this obligation of, of evil anymore. And there's a, there's a scene played by uh, uh, Brendan Gleeson, a great uh, Scottish actor, um, who plays Renaud de Chatillon, and he there's a scene where he says, um, after he attacks the caravan and murders everybody, um, as the Knights Templar, he says, uh, I am what I am. Somebody has to be. And these people have been led to believe they have to do this. They are what they are, and they have to do it. They don't have to do it. There's forgiveness for everyone. Everybody now, this notice has been served between now, well, June 12th, technically. Today's the first. But June 12th and December 21st, everybody who's played their role in doing evil on the earth has an opportunity to repent, to change the way they're doing things, and to see that we have in the wings ready a system to operate that will pick up exactly where everything left off, only this will be no more evil, no more usury, no more enslavement, no more starvation, no more drugs, no more purposeful created diseases to go around the world, no more fluoride, no more mercury, no more anything to actually cause damage but everything is to be done in love and that everybody can win. To have a system where everybody wins, that we don't need to reduce the population of the earth down to 500 million people like the Georgia Guidestones say, but we can have all 6.5 billion people live here in peace and everybody actually grow and mature and spiritually uh, rise at the same, at not the same rate necessarily, because nobody does that, but to have a chance to do it without having slavery hanging over their heads every day, worrying about where the bills are going to be to pay, um, you know, Ron, you've lost everything. I, I've lost everything. I, and uh, um, almost everybody I know who struggled to fight this fight has ended up losing everything. But I will say, um, and I think you'll contend, you'll agree with this on some parts, um, that if I hadn't lost everything, I wouldn't have gained everything I needed to know. And um, the truth and the knowledge of who I am and my connection with the divine creator of the universe and my connection with my other brothers and sisters on this planet and those that are on the other side is far greater than owning any possessions and fighting for any possessions whatsoever. And if, if we are doing what Frank has mentioned, which I do feel fully in my heart, that because hell was created as a concept and it's something that people believed, and when they died, they put their spirits there and held in some form of a hell or another. And I believe that the way this earth has been structured under debt has been a form of hell, in essence also for the past um, many thousands of years. And I think what we're doing right now is we're opening the gates of hell. We're opening the gates of hell. We're opening the gates of hell once and forever. And then we're freeing those that are here that are living in this present hell of suffering and not enough food and not enough everything to eat and, and everything uh, and suffering from wars and everything. And, and then for those that have passed that are, that are stuck in some form of a hell in the spiritual realm, that we can free all these people. And that if that's what we're doing, then we're changing everything. We are offering forgiveness to those that are still operating the scam on the earth. We're offering love and compassion and, 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 and a, an elimination of all the things that everybody suffered that is here now and has been here before us and literally freeing all of us to come into harmony and to create a balance unlike anything that this earth has experienced, at least since uh, Homo sapiens sapiens has been on this earth. And that's my, my prayer is that, all, that, every, that everything that we would... Um, we would all put this in prayer and that we would bring this to prayer and meditation. I do mine when I'm 
playing the piano and working on either music I've written or new music that I'm working on and, um, and let this all come out of us and let us find the proper balance with each other and in love and, and, uh, uh, wholeness. And, um, and again, I, I, I want to say something that I, I, I kind of alluded to on the call because Frank caught me off guard last week because I didn't, I didn't hit star eight at all. <laughs> but, um, but uh, um, I just want to say that, that Frank has opened up the door for everything for me to find the last pieces and, and brought love back into my life and my heart in a way that I didn't think I was going to experience again and, and then a joy to tell people a, a last answer. Oh, the last movie I wanted to lay out, I forgot to do that, was um, the third, third movie that I think there's a fourth one being made, I hope, but a third one that Ridley Scott made was, came out in 2010, and it was Robin Hood with um, Russell Crowe again as the lead. And that movie also is about the golden rule and the end of the divine right of kings. You can see the theme of the foolishness of divine right of kings in Gladiator, which is set at to the time of Marcus Aurelius, one of the only really great uh, Caesars of all time, emperors of Rome, um, and uh, his son Commodus, the insanity that came with him. And, of course, then we've had insanity, as Ron, you brought up last week with Frank, with October 14, 1066, um, uh, William the First, William the Conqueror, William the Norman, William the Bastard, taking over England. And of course, all your law dictionaries, your Black's law dictionaries, begin with that date as the first of the British regnal years, meaning that every monarchy from that point on until now is a complete fraud. There's not been a legitimate one, and Scott and others have been trying to tell us that there's no divine right of kings. And ironically, he sets the first, the, the second film, uh, Kingdom of Heaven, uh, begins, it, it opens with an introduction of the First Crusades, which began right after the foundation of the Roman cult, the Roman Catholic Church, which was 1057, William the First, 1066, and I believe the First Crusade fully was underway in 1099, or the first conquest of Jerusalem was in 1099. And um, there is no divine right of kings. So let's get that straight. There is no divine right of kings. There's no divine right of nobility. And even people like Frank and even if myself have bloodlines that go back to this thing, we have no claim to anything, nothing. It's for all men are equal. And Thomas Jefferson, who I think is still probably one of the greatest men who's ever lived on this earth, knew that. Not that all the other founders were all so great, but Jefferson knew it. And, um, and, that, and then this movie Robin Hood goes into the same thing. No divine right of kings following some idiot king off to fight stupid wars so he and his buddies can make more money off your death. It's just stupid. It's stupid. It's a bad idea. And, what, and I, I guess that's a better thing to say. What, what we're doing with Eucadia is we're bringing a new idea, a better idea, and an idea that works and has no controversy, has no duality, and it ends duality. I mean, it's the end of the bond market, the end of the slave trade, the end of uh, our, our birth certificates having any value. It's the end of anything having any value anymore. It's all coming to an end, their whole system. And, and I know there's people resisting this who are getting their, their retirement checks every month from bonds and all this, I can only say this to people that are dependent upon the prison bonds and all the other system that's operating right now. When this thing ends, which it's ending regardless, if it ends the way these people have it any right now, you're going to lose everything anyways. But if it ends with a system of love under the golden rule, a system of credit where everybody starts off with credit and everybody can start living their lives doing what they love to do as opposed to what they've been obligated to do. I mean, who out there in the right mind wants to go peddle stocks over the phone? Who wants to go sell this crap? I mean, who wants to, who wants to every day convince people to buy something that they know personally is no good? How would it like to be a loan broker right now trying to convince people to buy a house or any property at all? I mean, come on. It's, 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 it's totally antithetical to nature. But to be able to actually find our creativity again, to heal and restore people back and everybody rises to their highest level of, 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 of their artistic abilities and creative abilities and not for money, not so you can come up with something to make you more money, but so you can do something to actually help other people. Even people in the medical profession. I, I've known of emergency room doctors who had it with the drugs and the psychiatrists prescribing drugs. And there was one case here in, in, in North Idaho where a friend of mine took a a woman who was dying, literally dying, from taking 12 different drugs that a psychiatrist had prescribed. And when she, when she got in the, in the ER room, the senior ER doctor was on duty, and he took complete control of the case, told everybody to get out, that she was going to die unless he did some drastic measures right then and there. Saved her life. Okay, pumped her stomach, got her body to where it was stabilizing, 
And then he, then it was all over, and she was stabilized and, and, and gotten her to evacuate both ways out of her system. He called a psychiatrist up who'd been scri- prescribing drugs for, I, I know, several hundred people since he'd been up in, in North Idaho, and he was a graduate of Berkeley and Stanford. Uh, no, I'm sorry, UCLA and Berkeley. And, and he, the doctor read him the riot act, and a friend of mine heard him do that. Well, it must have had an impact on that psychiatrist because that 67-year-old psychiatrist two weeks later died of a heart attack. Now, we didn't want him to die, but he stopped doing what he was doing. And the court of conscience is the highest court there is in the universe. And that is the court that rules. And that is the court that rules me. That's the one that should rule all of us. And when we live under the golden rule and we have the court of conscience out before us, we can't do any wrong. So... There, and by the way, court of conscience is in all your old law dictionaries. You know, I, don't, I don't think it's written the same definition that it was back in the first and second, maybe the third Black's Law Dictionary, but I'm sure it's been altered to something corrupt now. But basically it really means the conscience, that's going, something that's going on in the heart and something that's going on in the head, and drawing those together to live in balance. Anyways, sorry guys, I just went off on that, but I had to share that tonight. So um, I, wanted to, I wanted to share with what I felt from my heart that I, I want everybody to know that as far as I'm concerned, um, Franco Collins is the um, uh, finest teacher on earth and the finest man I've ever heard speak. Not had the privilege to meet face to face, but I could tell you that um, there's no guile in him, just like that passage there about Jesus saying about Philip, no guile. It's all a heart of gold. And I thank Frank and all the other men that, and women that have been working with him and presenting this. And uh, it's time for us to introduce this to the world, bring it out all the way. You guys there? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, that was wonderful. Um, yeah, I mean, it is getting, uh, things are being exposed. The information is there. And um, it's like we have all, several of us have talked with Frank about that it is being looked at. I mean, it is, uh, there are some things happening just from the information uh, being out and public and uh, with the processes that occurred in um, 2009 and 2010 um, for those of us that were uh, involved in, in moving some of those forward back then. But it's really, you know, things are happening. Um, they are. The fact that the Pope would make that speech at Christmas, I think it was his Christmas speech where he said this is the end of the garments rolled in blood, and it took mm-hmm. Frank to explain that, what that meant, and um, the fact that this is they're, they're not acknowledging that this is the end. It's almost like, thank God it's finally over. We don't have to do this anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There is a relief, relief I mean, of, of, um, of having to continue. Yeah. In fact, that we, line, talked about, we talked about that a long time ago. Several of us did. Anyway, go ahead. No, the, 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 when Frank found the family motto, you know, the line that he, you know, the ones that he was impressed with were might makes right and all this other stuff. And his family motto was virtue conquers peril. I think it was Vincent Auricula Virtus or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, virtue conquers peril. That that says it all. That's like, they, that's why they've had to sell us fear all the time. You know, they've had to use fear or fraud, fear, and force to control us because um, without the fear, people start to wake up and realize who they are. So they have to keep us in a perpetual state of fear. For, for me, it was the elimination of television and all news sources other than reading stories. You know, I'd read stories, but I wouldn't ever look at them on their video clips anymore. And that started freeing me up from every any connection there and um, not worried about it. And then another thing is this. The bar associ- there are people in the bar association that know something's wrong, and that 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 um, they know that th- they can't sustain this forever, that they can't keep destroying people forever, and it's like the fact that there's been grace given or offered to these people um, to repent and to change the way they're doing things without a full judgment coming down on their heads should really be a um, opportunity that all of these people who participated at various levels, all the way down to the local clerk and local sheriff's deputy and police officer, they need to all take into account that this opportunity is a window that's been given them now to stop, and they need to take advantage of it. And now 
begin the transition over from this. Instead of ramping up for more violence and evil, they need to 